So if you were going to take a trip to middle America, um, you might stop in the state of Nebraska. And one thing that most people don't know about Nebraska is that about a third of the state is covered with these beautiful sand hills. They're called the Nebraska sand hills. And these are pristine habitats, um, whereas much of the rest of the state is covered in agriculture. There's a lot of corn, um, cows grazing. Because this is very sanding habitat, it's, it's almost untouched. And we know something about the geological history of these sand dunes. They were formed about uh, 10,000 years ago, erosion from the Rocky Mountains. So essentially, in the middle of Nebraska, you have these beautiful light-colored sand dunes surrounded by dark soil prairies. And if you went on uh, to these sand hills and put out some traps, you'd catch a very special mouse. It's a mouse that's um, almost golden in color and almost perfectly matches uh, the background, that soil color. Um, that you find in the sand hills. This is in contrast to the same species of mouse, if you caught it off the sand hills, would be a typical brown colored mouse. Now, since we know something about the age of the sand hills, we can also predict that these mice probably got light about uh, no earlier than 10,000 years ago as they started to colonize these new sand dunes. And our big question was, can we identify the genetic changes responsible for this light coloration? And not just what the genes are, but the mutations in those genes and understand how those mutations work to produce changes in color. So we were able to take mice, the dark and light form, from the sand hills and right off the sand hills, bring them back to the lab, and do crosses between these mice to pinpoint a, a gene that has a major effect on color. And what we found was a gene called the agouti signaling protein. It's a gene that's been studied for a number of years by mouse geneticists as it's a mutation that's occurred in laboratory colonies. It was one of the first mutations described and it was uh, loosely termed obese yellow because these mice with this mutation in the agouti gene uh, were obese huge, giant, fat mice, uh, and then this beautiful blonde color. So what's interesting is now we found that this gene may be involved in natural adaptation, not just a spontaneous mutation like this obese yellow one in the, in the lab. And what we were interested in is asking how do changes in these genes actually produce changes in phenotype, or in this case, uh, pigmentation differences. So what we were able to do was sequence the gene and we found that there were no differences in the protein. And instead, what we found was that there were differences in the expression level. In fact, the lighter mice had higher expression. But this makes especially um, sense when we think about the hairs of these particular mice. So most mammals, in general, have hairs unlike human hairs. So if you pulled out one of your hairs, you would see that it was uniform in color. So my hair is mostly blonde. Um, other people's hair may be mostly um, dark color. And that's because we have two types of pigment, either eumelanin, which is sort of brown to black. And whether you have brown or black is just a matter of concentration. Um, I have pheomelanin, which can be blonde to red, again, just based on the number of um, uh, melanosomes in your hair. But most mammals are much more exciting than humans in terms of their pigmentation. They still only have those two types. But even within a single hair, they can switch between dark and light pigment. So if you look at your dog or your cat, for example, or pluck out a hair, you can see that they might have black at the base and then blonde, uh, blonde patch and then a white tip, for example. And these mice are that way too. They generally have uh, eumelanin at the base pheomelanin or blonde in the middle, and black tip. And that gives them this sort of grisly look to them. And what we, when you look at the hairs of these mice from the sand hills and off the sand hills, what you find is mice on the sand hills, that blonde band is simply larger. And that gives them this overall golden color compared to the off the sand hills mice. And this is associated with the change in agouti expression. So you can imagine as a hair first grows in a little pink baby mouse, the hairs are growing in, they're all coordinated, and the tip grows out, and then, uh, and then you keep growing like this. Well, agouti is a gene that's expressed during hair growth, and it's expressed as a pulse. And when the expression is on, you switch from dark pigment to light pigment. So here you go, the hair is growing, there's no agouti, you get dark pigment. Then boom, a burst of uh, agouti comes on and you get a light band, and then agouti goes away and you get a dark base.
Now the difference between these two mice, the golden mice and the brown mice, is simply agouti is on at a higher level and for a longer period of time. And so that band in the middle of the hair is longer, giving them this overall golden color. So here we have now a gene that affects the coat color, which affects their survival of these mice in the wild. And we could have stopped the story there because we, here we found a gene involved in adaptation. But we were really interested in the mutations that are involved. So why were we interested in the mutations? Well, if you have the mutations in hand, you can start to understand how precisely changes in gene expression evolve. So what we did is we sequenced the entire agouti gene. And now agouti, the protein is quite small. Um, so it has three exons each, um, about uh, uh, 600 base pairs each. But it has this huge regulatory region, which is very common for a mammalian gene. And what I mean by regulatory region is simply it's the part of the DNA sequence that has elements in it that control where and when that protein is expressed. So we sequenced about 200,000 base pairs in hundreds of individuals of mice that we caught on the edge of the sand dunes. And the edge is important because that's where dark and light mice come and meet and mate. And they're all scrambled up. And so we could then ask which, in that sort of heterogeneous population, which mutations were associated with the lighter forms and the darker forms. And initially what we thought was that we would find one mutation in there that would affect you know, have a big effect on um, overall coat color. But in fact, we found the opposite. So let me give you a little bit more background. So originally, when I started telling you the story, I said there was sort of a golden mouse and a dark mouse. And that's originally what we thought. But when you look more closely at the mice, not only are they more golden, and their hairs are different in um, this banding pattern, but where the belly and the back color meet is shifted up, the um, not only is the, the hairs uh, have this different banding pattern, but they're also lighter. The tail stripe is different, the pigment on their face. So there were a number of these subtle changes that together gave this overall phenotype. So when we looked at the, um, this gene structure, what we found instead of this one mutation was that we found lots of mutations. In fact, we found nine mutations. And when we asked what aspect of the coat color phenotype did that mutation correlate with, each of those nine mutations affected something different. So one, as I described earlier, affects the banding pattern. Another one affects where that, the belly color and the back color, what we call the dorsal ventral boundary, where that is. Another was associated with the amount of striping on the tail. Another was affecting the belly color. So here was this big surprise. We thought there'd be one mutation that would have, you know, sort of what we call pleiotropic effects and affect all the different aspects of color. But instead, we found this very fine-tuned association. Each one of those mutations in the light mouse caused the mouse to be lighter, but independently of each other. So what that means is, in this case, evolution worked through very the accumulation of these very small mutations, all even just within a single gene, to fine-tune this phenotype to be optimal for its given habitat. Here's the other exciting piece of the puzzle. What we can do once we have identified these mutations is we could ask, is there a signal of selection in patterns of DNA variation? So what we mean by that is that we have now the sequences of this regulatory region from a whole bunch of different animals. And where you ha may have had selection, if there's a beneficial mutation, that mutation is going to go in higher frequency in the light population because individuals that carry that mutation are going to survive better. And that leaves a footprint in the DNA. So we can ask, do we see this footprint around those mutations? And out of the nine mutations, eight of them had this signature of selection. So what that means is that each one of these mutations which affects a different aspect of color, in fact has a signature of positive selection, which suggests that each aspect of pigmentation actually did improve fitness. So even traits, we were focusing just on the dorsal color, but even the belly color seems to have an effect on fitness, which may not be uh, intuitive. So here's an example of a story in which going down, not stopping at the level of the gene, but actually going down and burrowing in to the precise mutations can tell us something not just about um, sort of the molecular mechanisms, how gene expression evolves, but also told us something back at the organismal level that we didn't know before. That is, tail stripe matters for fitness, ventral coloration matters for fitness, banding pattern matters 
matters for fitness, et cetera. So here's a case where finding mutations, doing the hardcore molecular level uh, details, actually told us something about organismal level uh, biology. The next step in this research is to actually go in and now of these nine mutations, what we want to do is understand how that affects gene expression. Does it affect where the protein is expressed, when is ex it's expressed, the level at which it's expressed. And preliminary uh, details suggest that these mutations act independently. Some occur in um, regions that are sort of known as um, regulatory elements, so for example promoters um, that affect uh, the expression of the gene. But we're also seeing other neat little hints like um, some ex um, affect splice variation. That is you get slightly different versions of non-coding exons that attach to the proteins and so this also is another way in which expression can evolve that we didn't know about um, previously. So one of the biggest challenges to this research is that we know a lot about proteins. So for example, we know an ATG signals the start of the protein. We know what stop, codon stop codons look like. We know usually where exon intron boundaries are. It's, and we often can predict um, quite readily what an amino acid mutation would do to the conformation of the protein and hence its function. The regulatory regions of genes are almost completely unknown. So there's no way, there's no easy way to really predict, to know, it's easy to predict, but it's hard to know um, where regulatory elements are. That is where the DNA binding sites are that transcription factors come down and sit on and change the expression of genes. So the big challenge is, is that we're working in this big, vast, unknown area. And in mammals, these regulatory regions can be hundreds of uh, thousands of base pairs away from the proteins that it actually controls. So in some ways it's a big challenge, in another way it's really exciting because anything that we find is going to be new and interesting. <laughs>